Hello and welcome. In this series of videos, I'm going to be discussing the parent-child relationships in Maya, as well as the use of constraints so that we can create a simple animation rig for a mechanical arm or another similar model. And I want to start off just by kind of talking about what parent-child relationships are in the first place. If you've ever created a group in Maya, you may be familiar with this and not actually realize it. So if I drag select all these objects and then press Control G, I've now created a group. You can see this in my outliner over here. This group is the parent of these objects. And these objects are now children of this group. And what that means is that the children objects will inherit the transform information of the parent. So if I were to rotate the group, all the child objects will rotate as well. If I translate the group, all of the child objects will translate. And if I were to scale the group, all the child objects will scale as well. Now, similar to like a toy box or something like that, you would think that you could move the toys around separately from the toy box and the box would not move. But if we went back to the toy box and moved the toy box, all of the toys should follow the toy box. And that's exactly how that works in Maya as well. I'm going to go ahead and ungroup these really quick. And I can do that by selecting them and middle mouse dragging them out. That's one way. Another way I could do this is by selecting them and pressing Shift P as in parent, and that will unparent the objects. And then I'm going to go ahead and just delete this group. Objects can be parented to other objects as well. If I take the ball, the cone, and the log, and then I middle mouse drag them into the box, the box is now the parent of these objects. So instead of using a group, this time I used a physical object. So basically a group is acting like an empty object in this particular situation. And again, I can move these objects around in space, and then when I go back to the box itself, they still will be accepting the transform of the parent. Now the limitation of this, when I had the group set up, I could select the group, get all of the objects, but if I still wanted to select the box, I could select it separately from the child objects. In this particular object-based parenting, when I select the box, I get the children objects selected as well. And this can cause some problems. For example, if I come down and try to assign a new material, Notice it happens to all the selected objects. So while I have control over their transforms, I don't have good control of selecting things individually. And this is really where the use of constraints comes in because it gives us the best of both of those worlds. We can still select objects and work with them individually for the purpose of unwrapping UVs for texture and materials and things like that. But we also have control objects that maintain for animation reasons. I'm going to go ahead and hide my toy box example. And we're going to come up to this drop down at the top left of Maya. And we're going to set this to rigging. And by doing so, the menu set will change and we'll have a constrain option. I'm going to go ahead and open that and then click the dotted lines at the top to tear it off so that we can talk about this. We have a parent option point, orient, scale, aim, and Pull vector I'm not really going to talk about today. We use those for our IK arms and legs um, for movement of the elbows and the knees and things like that. So we're not really going to discuss that today, but I'm going to talk a little bit about these first ones. And to do this, I'm going to need some example objects. So I'm just going to create a cube really quick and scale it out. And then I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this cube and offset it so that you can see where it's at. Okay, so now that I have this offset over, I can go to this parent option and open up the options box. If you're ever not sure if this is set to its default settings or not, you can go to the edit tab and say reset settings and then you know for a fact you have the default settings. Right at the top we have this checkbox for maintain offset. We've got constraint of translate all, rotate all. So the biggest difference between a parent constraint and a group or an object-based parent is that a parent constraint does not affect scale. It only affects the translation and the rotation of an object. If I wanted to affect scale, we have a scale constraint for that. What maintain offset does is you'll notice that this object is not in the same location as this object. 
If maintain offset is not turned on, this object's pivot point will snap to the pivot point of the parent object. If maintain offset is checked, this object will stay where it is, and the constraint will still happen, but these two objects will maintain their offset. So typically we want to leave that on. The way we set these constraints up is by first selecting the object we want to have control and then selecting the child object. So if I'm in my scene view, I would want to select one, the parent object, and then hold shift to select the child. If I'm doing this in the outliner, you would want to use control just in case there's any objects in between the objects you're trying to select. Shift would then grab a band of selection. So control in that case. So parent first, then the child, and then we go ahead and we just say add. Now in my outliner you can see that p cube 2, the child object, has this p cube 2 parent constraint 1. So if I ever want the parent constraint not to exist anymore, I could simply select and delete it. Another thing that you'll notice if I have this child object selected is that in the channel box for it, we have a bunch of keyed channels now. And that's telling us that something is controlling these channels for us, in which case it happens to be this parent object. Similar to how the object and the group based parent worked, if I select the parent object at this point, I can translate this object around can rotate the object around. However, scale will change the location based on the pivot, but it will not change the overall size. I'm going to go ahead and reset that to zero. One thing that's really important when we're doing constraints of any sort, or object-based grouping, any of those, we need to make sure that we do not have transform information in any of our scales. So what I mean by that, if I come over here and delete this particular constraint, so now we're back to just two separate objects here. I'm going to take p cube 2 and middle mouse drag it inside of p cube 1. So what we've done is create an object-based parent-child relationship. I know I can translate the parent, I know that I can rotate the parent, and I know that I can scale the parent, and the child object reacts correctly. If I select the child object, it can be translated independently of the parent. It can be rotated independently. Ah, it can't. So this is what happens when we don't freeze transforms. This is called shearing. What's happening is this object has a scale, when I first created it, of 10 in X. And by dropping it inside, notice that its second object is saying this is a value of 1, because this is its new normal position but it's trying to maintain that as I rotate it. This is happening because I did not freeze the transformations. So if I undo and I drag this cube out, then I freeze the transforms, modify, freeze transformations. Now if I drop p cube 2 into p cube 1, you'll notice that it does not shear. It actually stays its standard size. So freezing transformations is inherently very important while we do this process. Another thing that's very important is pivot locations. So if I select both of these objects and I rotate, notice that they come apart. They don't bend like an arm or a tail or something. And what's happening is they're both rotating around their pivot locations. And if this was actually a joint, this object, this second child object, should not be rotating from its center. It should be rotating from where the joint actually is. So if I take these and move the pivots back so that they hinge from a place that makes more sense, then we go ahead and select them and rotate them. You'll notice that now they stay intact, like a chain or tail or an arm or something. And this is how we want this to react. All right. So now that we've cleared that up, let's go ahead and talk about how we can actually use these uh, rest of these constraints here. So I'm going to go ahead, unparent my cube. We're going to talk about this point constraint. If I select the parent object, then the child, and we put a point constraint, point constraint will only control the position. So now if I translate the parent around, the child will follow. However, if the parent is rotated or scaled, the children will not follow. So this literally only is controlling translation. Go ahead and delete that. 
we also have an orient constraint. So I'll select the parent, then the child, and I'll put an orient constraint on this. Now what's interesting about orients, they affect rotation only. But they do it based on each object's local pivot position. So if I grab this uh, parent object and I start rotating, notice that they rotate around their local pivot. No matter what direction this gets rotated, it's going to always rotate around its local pivot point. And if I take this child object and move the pivot location, and then we come back to the parent and we do some rotation. Notice now that they're both rotating from different positions. So the orient's always going to be local pivot position only. Okay, let me delete that constraint. Next, if I select the first and the second and put a scale constraint, this will not affect rotation. It will not affect translation, but I do have scale control of this object now. Again, based on their local pivot positions. So if I move this pivot location back and then I scale the parent, instead of scaling from this end, it's going to scale from the new pivot location. All right, let me go ahead and delete that constraint. The next one that we've got in the list here is this aim. And aims are great, especially for rigging eyes. The way that they work is the parent, in this case, is what the object, child object, is going to look at. <clears throat> so if I select the parent, then select the child, and we go to this aim option, open up this options box, I get to decide, do I want to maintain the offset or not? In this case, yes, I do want to maintain my offset. Then we've got this aim vector. So these are in order x, y, z. So this object here, if I wanted this particular end of it to aim, that would be plus x. If I wanted it to be based off of its z, then I would set it to z. If I wanted its y-axis to be the one doing the looking, then we would set this to plus 1 in y. I want this to look down the x in this case, and I want its up vector to be the standard of y in Maya space. And then I'm going to go ahead and leave it to constrain all axes and say add. Oops, I need the child object selected. So let me select the child object and then we'll add it. Now what happens is if the child object is moved around, it will stay aimed at that location. If I grab the parent and move the parent around, the child object will stay aimed without it moving. And this is great. We can use this as a way to aim eyeballs um, or anything like that that we need to stay looking in a certain direction. And that's the essential workflow of how these constraints work. You always want to select a parent, then select a child, double check that your options are set correctly, and then add your constraint. Okay, so that's covering the basics of how this system's going to work. In the next video, what I'm going to do is bring in an example robot, and we're going to set it up with constraints so that we can animate the robot.